The Human Founder Podcast by Gali Blochli Ram. Hi, I'm Gali Blochli Ram and welcome to The Human Founder, the podcast where we speak about the mental aspects of the entrepreneurial journey. Entrepreneurs and investors often describe the emotional roller coaster that is embedded in being an entrepreneur investor, where you experience the highest of highs, such as uh, when you make a successful investment, and the lowest of lows when something you worked hard for fails. And it's from that place of uncertainty, the need to constantly self-manage ourselves, keep up our energy and be mentally resilient in order to deal with everything, well, it's not easy. In each episode, I will be talking to entrepreneurs, investors, psychologists, being their sounding board with the goal of creating a space for this less spoken about layer, which is the mental aspect accompanying the entrepreneurial journey. I will also share tips and tricks to help boost your focus, clarity and mental resilience. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Shira Etting. Hey, Shira, it's really great to have you here with me. Thanks for having me. Shira, uh, you are an investor, part of Vintage Investment Team. that invests in some of the world's most successful venture funds and companies. Prior to Vintage, you served in uh, several positions in the public, private, and non-profit sectors, including a helicopter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, Milken Fellow at the Ministry of Economy, consultant at McKinsey, and CEO of Nation. You hold a BSc in Math and Computer Science from Ben-Gurion University and an MSc in Environmental Change and Management from Oxford, You serve as a flight instructor in reserves, married to Shani, and expecting your third child together. So I'm really, really excited um, to speak with you t- today. You're so interesting and full of surprises and full of amazing things. So let's hit it on. <laughs> awesome. Excited to be here as well. <laughs> That's great. So maybe, you know, a bit about your childhood and then how it all began, like your professional career as a pilot in the Israeli Air Force. Take us there. So, um, I grew up in uh, Maccabim since the age of two. My father is a pilot, was a pilot in the Air Force, and uh, my mother is a psychoanalyst. And I think that I, uh, I represent uh, the combination of, of both of them. That's serious. Uh, yes. We, <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy, a very ambitious house. Um, but I think that what my parents did in a very good way is that they um, let each one of us, each one of the siblings become... Uh, what what we wanted to uh, with a lot of freedom so I become became a pilot uh, my brother became a dancer uh, we kind of switched positions if uh, if you're taking the gender lens and my sister is uh, on on a path to become a, a psychologist herself um, very talented uh, children yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so I think um, um, they, they kind of um, gave us this um, um, a, lot, a lot of ambition and also what you mentioned about being a serious, uh, yeah, we are a very serious house. Um, and I was uh, kind of, uh, I was very close to my father as a, as a child um, and, um, and really wanted to become what he was. Um, and I think that the fact that I was a girl really didn't, um, just didn't play a role in that. It was... I think what he um, conveyed to me was that everything is possible. It was just uh, like really a non-issue if I was a, a girl or a boy. And, um, and as time went by, I realized, uh, so when I was about 10, I think the first woman graduated from Flat Academy and my, my father told me about it. And I still remember that very moment when he told me about it. And uh, what did you feel back then? It's funny because I was, uh, <laughs> you know, I was nine or 10 years old. And I remember I was a bit upset that someone like was first before me. <laughs> <laughs> someone took you uh, the first time. But, you know, we have in our life those moments that we remember and that they were really, really uh, uh, like clues to what will come uh, later on in life and were really important for the way that we shape ourselves later on. So that's amazing you remember this it is and I think it's really like the uh, Steve Jobs connecting connecting the dots so I think that's definitely a dot that was connected later on um, and yeah and, and and as time went by I went to high school I realized that uh, I want to join flight Academy I postponed my service I did a uh, one year of uh, Schnatcher um, 
So volunteering activity for one year in a boarding school. What did it give you? What did it give you to be in the Shnat Shirut? So I think today when, when cadets approach me, and uh, not cadets, but high school uh, students approach me and ask me, what, what should I do to, to succeed in Flight Academy or to have a meaningful service, then my first advice for them is go and do Shnat Shirut or uh, Mechina. Mm-hmm. Postpone your year and, and uh, your service and uh, do one year of uh, volunteering activity. Um, I think it just it gives you a year in which you you grow up so much by not thinking about yourself but thinking about other people by living with people your age by being independent uh, it's also a difficult year so you become much more resilient um, for me as someone who grew up in Maccabim and went to Kanot uh, I worked with the uh, Uh, with people who made Aliyah from the Soviet Union. So it was also about kind of the bubble w- really exploded, which was something very difficult, but also very important to me. And I realized there is no real mobility in the Israeli society. So I met with, um, with many very talented um, guys, boys and girls. And I just knew that they could be very talented and motivated, but they're... chance of uh, for example joining flight Academy it doesn't exist or is very limited and it's just because of uh, you know the house that I was uh, born to versus their uh, starting point so it's it's pretty amazing to see how those how this year really uh, uh, have a huge impact on the path that you chose to take later on and the values that you gained uh, from this year as a as 18 year old girl. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think that part of uh, it enhanced my social activity. And I think that throughout my career, I, um, I either uh, served in positions in that sector or tried to, to keep that involvement alive. And, and also today I, uh, I volunteer and I'm part of uh, several uh, advisory boards in, uh, in nonprofit organizations. And I, I think it's like for me, it's very f- fulfilling, but... I think that ideally every person that works in the private sector should have some um, some points in life where he or she devote their time to to help others and give and give back give back give back for sure is it something that you look at when you uh, uh, dealing with your company or uh, considering an investment is this something that uh, maybe uh, in a conscious way or subconscious way is it something that you try to see and to look if the founders uh, share the same uh, value set hmm. like you that's an interesting question I think it's it's um, it's a bit problematic in a way because founders could be very successful while being very different than I am uh, and it's a strong bias to look for people who are like you and investors and people like you so I try really not to to take this dimension I definitely value that in people so if I see a founder that that devotes time for that activity time or money or any resource I highly value it but it's it's not a must um, and I try to to promote it so when I'm talking to founder founders or companies I talk to them about ways of being involved uh, in social activity and um, and I think that also you just in 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 what I'm doing in, in those advisory boards in the organizations I take part in trying to to make our impact larger so then uh, after the Mechina after the Shnachirut you go uh, you actually go to the flight academy how does it feel to be a, a, a woman uh, it's pretty much in the beginning it's uh, only several years since we had a flight the first day flight attend a flight uh, Pilot. Uh, pilot, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and how does it feel being there? So I can talk about it for hours. <laughs> um, I, I think that generally, so I, I joined Flight Academy in 2005. That's 10 years after Bagatz Alice Miller um, that, you know, I'm very grateful for and I owe her personally a lot. Um, and the the f- The funny thing or the sad thing is that actually when when I was in flight academy and when I graduated back when I was 21 if you ask me how is it to be a girl uh, I would have told you it's the same right so uh, everyone can succeed you just need to be good enough um, and uh, and yeah and I made it and I'm happy for it 
And uh, when you ask me now, I, my answer is totally different. What is your answer currently? So my answer currently is that definitely the Air Force wants women to succeed. And I think that most people are very positive about it and uh, are being professional. Uh, but I think that we also still have a long way to go in order to make sure that we really provide um, an equal opportunity to girls who join Flight Academy. So there is a gap. Yeah, I think there is a gap. It's not, it's not an easy to solve gap. Um, many of the problems begin just with the fact that you are a minority. So many women don't apply to Flight Academy, don't have the same motivation. Uh, and the numbers of, of, of women who start compared to the number of men who start Flight Academy is, is very low. So with this is a starting point, and, and that's something that the Air Force doesn't have a lot of impact on. It has some, but not a lot. A difficult uh, point to begin with. Uh, but even after that, making sure that, you know, starting from the, from the logistics and then with how we train women and how we command them and uh, how we analyze their social performance and how sensitive we are to the differences between men and women. So I think that all of those very soft points are sometimes hard to um, grasp, hard to understand. Um, but it's something that is, is crucial uh, for us as an organization to, to adapt in order to make sure that we really um, give women the same opportunity. So it's, it's really interesting what you're saying because um, back then, while you were in the Flight Academy, you didn't feel it. And as you grew older and become more mature, then all of a sudden you see it from a different pers perspective. And maybe it was... some kind of a rationalization that you had b back then in order to cope with everything and to succeed uh, in this? I mean, how, how did you address the challenges that you felt as a woman in the Flight Academy, which is not very common back then, it's also not very common nowadays, but even then in the beginning, how did you feel that you are uh, addressing the challenges by the fact that you had your dad to speak to and share experiences or uh, other women that were there with you or the uh, uh, um, commanders that you had there? What, what were the things that helped you go through it? So I think, first of all, it's, it's uh, important to say that despite, you know, my, um, call it criticism, um, the, the, the amount of support that I received was tremendous from, you know, from my family, from my friends. From people at Flight Academy, so I think that, that really most people are very, very um, uh, positive about it and, and they supported me a lot. Um, I think that, that what I did in order to succeed and I only realized it in hindsight was that I you know I looked around me, I asked myself, what does it take to succeed? I realized that the more I behave like men, my uh, My chances of succeeding are higher and that's what I did and I did it without acknowledging it right so it was subconscious but for example I realized that if I cry I lose points uh, so I just don't I didn't cry or when I cried it was uh, on my own uh, at my room alone um, or I realized that I must sound very assertive so I try to sound very assertive um, I, uh, I, I really became one of the guys with the, with the jokes and with, with the sports. And, and to be honest, it was also very easy for me because I was, I was a tomboy growing up. I was always one of the guys. I always felt com more comfortable being a girl with a lot of boys friends, than, yeah. yeah, a lot of boys as friends rather than being with a lot of girls as friends. So for me, it was easier. But I think that the downside of that is that today... If I uh, exaggerate to make a point, I think that today the women who succeeded Flight Academy are the women that can behave like men. And real diversity is about women that can, be, can behave like women. Accepting them for who they are and not trying to shape them to be someone or something else. Exactly. And this is a gap that needs to be uh, uh, breached and, and to see how it's like a... We talk about equality, like, uh, like uh, Arista used to say, it's not like that everyone needs to be the same, but 
uh, treat with the same uh, principles of equality towards women and to, towards the different uh, uh, groups in the society and equality that is right for the men or other kind of groups and not to try to uh, uh, do the same between the different groups because we're not the same. Exactly. That's exactly the point. And I think and always when I talk about the Air Force and when I talk to pilots, I think that the point that is very important to make is that we're not compromising on the end result. So at the end of the day, it's not a, you know, it's not a social experiment. It's not a nonprofit organization. It's part of the IDF. It, you know, it, it protects our lives as citizens here. Um, we, you know, we don't have uh, another opportunity. We won't have another opportunity in case of a war. So the, the, the level of what we do at the end of the day cannot be compromised by a, one percentage. But I argue that with different behaviors or like uh, uh, using Aristo's uh, words, um, the different groups and the different uh, ways of, of behavior can definitely lead us to the same end results or even improve us. And, and this is just a, um, a mental state or a, th- a, th- a way of thinking that people need to embrace. And sometimes it's difficult to embrace this uh, change because we don't really know how to address it. But that's the progress and that's the way that uh, we should do definitely we should go so did you like it like being a yes yes pilot? it was I'm, I'm very happy for this it, it has really shaped me um, and a lot of my behavior today and a lot of my confidence is uh, is rooted uh, with uh, the journey that I started back then uh, I, I was surrounded and still surrounded by uh, very talented and Uh, men and women and people that I uh, really love and um, that's also why I still serve in reserves in flight Academy um, it's a place that I feel a great honor to be part of and uh, many of my friends today are you know pilots in the Air Force um, yeah mainly like the mentally wise beyond the confidence what do you feel that these are the main things that you took with you and from uh, your army service as a pilot into your uh, professional lives uh, later on? So the Air Force is, a, is a, an exceptional organization in its professionalism. I think that's the first thing that I took. So the way you, you treat uh, a flight is, uh, is like uh, being a professional athlete, uh, for example. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's very much in the details and the amount of knowledge you should have about the aircraft that you're flying and the accuracy you need to act in. Um, so so this, this professionalism is uh, something that, that I definitely took with me. I think that another thing is um, the, the famous debrief in the Air Force. So this is something that you really learn how it, it becomes a part of you. So I debrief anything in my life. Um, and I think that the, the third thing is that way do you also debrief the, the good things or just the bad things <laughs> that yeah that's a good question um, so the Air Force actually teaches you to debrief the bad things and I think that with time I learned also to uh, to debrief the good things and that is actually something that McKinsey do well so McKinsey teach you how to build on your strength and this is also something that I uh, I try to do and also sometimes when I fly with cadets I ask them like you did that you That specific drill you did very well, what helped you do it very well? And this is a very powerful tool because um, debriefing the, the bad results is like uh, it makes sense and we understand why we need to do it and we want to learn from it and to improve. But also debriefing the good results and what led us there and how did we behave or act that led us into a specific result. It's also very good and very important to understand because then we can... Uh, duplicated and we can make it a routine and then we can save time and save negotiations with ourselves or with others because we know it works and it's also a boost of good energy and feeling of achievement that we get these good things and to stop and reflect on it which sometimes as founders and entrepreneurs it happened in a good way great let's continue we don't even stop and pause to appreciate and debriefing also the good things helps us to pause for a second to appreciate it and To breathe it into us and then to continue and it's very very important in order to build our mental resilience yeah I, I fully agree and, I, and just to add on it I think that eventually when when we try to be successful at what we do we start with our strength and then we kind of 
we know what are, um, uh, let's say, disadvantages or what our weaknesses are, and we try to, you know, to address them or to minimize them. Um, but if we only think about our uh, disadvantages or weaknesses, it takes us, it Down. doesn't take us far. Yeah, I agree. So you took the confidence and the professionalism and accuracy and uh, the briefing method. Anything else or these like the, the highlights? And I think also resiliency. Mm-hmm. Um, so I served for eight and a half years, three years flight academy and, and five and a half years more. And I think that um, especially today, When it's so easy to to say I'm doing something for for 12 months I've had enough this is be- becoming I'm, I'm bored I'm not successful I don't like my boss and then just moving to the next thing and I think that being a part of such an organization that doesn't let you uh, give up um, it also develops this resiliency so I totally agree and maybe I'll add to it something that even more so than the resilience uh, that it's actually your uh, The way that you perform there and even with all the challenges etc it's also the grit this ability that doesn't matter what happens you continue and you continue for eight and a half years which is a lot if we look at it as an organ organization not necessarily the IDF as a professional organization in the highest levels uh, to do it for eight and a half years it's a lot and it's in peak performance and it's uh, uh, risking your life in some of the missions and It requires a lot from you uh, to keep up the pace and the high level all the time and it's a lot of grit uh, to be uh, 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 to be in uh, this situation 100% so so the army and eight and a half years are uh, you, you finished and I'm sure that dad was very very uh, proud of you this whole uh, period and then what so actually I finished my military service before I was supposed to So I was I was supposed to serve for 12 years and then my squadron was closed uh, because we were flying all the helicopters and I had the option of choosing between uh, um, moving to a different squadron and flying a different aircraft um, or or quitting and um, and they, this was a very difficult point from for, for me because um, I felt that the, the brave thing to do was to actually leave and not to stay why? Because I think that at the age of 26, where you have this understanding that you could serve for four more years um, and, and, and you know everyone and you know the world that you work in um, and the culture, um, then it's really staying in your comfort zone mm-hmm. in a way. And um, so, so that's, that's the first part. And the second part, I think, is also when I left, it was about understanding that this is the end of my dream. Um, so if I when I graduated from Flight Academy um, during the Miss um, Darkna Fine the ceremony uh-huh. the, the, all the excitement I, I, I told myself I want to become a squadron commander um, and and quitting at the age of 26 was understanding that this dream is not going to happen uh, so it's like letting letting go the dream the yes. big dream I mean, yes even being a pilot is a dream but then once you achieve one dream so you You have another dream and a higher dream and a higher dream and it's actually the understanding that this will end here yes so it's like two different uh, voices one okay I want to achieve the highest level of uh, being a pilot uh, and commander that I, I wanted to and then it is in, 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 in the same thing and the same feeling is that I have to go out of my comfort zone because this is the easy it's not really easy but this is the the known thing for me this is the some the thing that I'm that they feel convenient in that I'm already familiar with and just living and getting to know other people other industries other verticals other uh, cultures this is actually making the the difference making the leap yes and and, and I left not knowing what's going to happen next right so no one promised me that I'm gonna uh, get accepted to Oxford uh, for my masters and no one told me that I will be accepted to McKinsey and Uh, so it was about leaving and, and starting this new journey, not knowing how successful it will be. Um, and it was also living to a world, you know, people that, that leave the military at age of 21 or 22 and, and do their bachelor's degree as just normal students, they just learned how the world behaves. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know that I was you in had the blind first. spots. I had like huge blind spots uh, that I had to cover for. Um, so at the age of 26 I found myself 
outside of the Air Force. Uh, um, how do you address this? Uh, how do you address those blind spots? Like all of a sudden you were like here and a pl- pilot and like everything is is known and you're very uh, people are respecting you and all of a sudden you're part of you know the mass yes <laughs> and you're outside <laughs> of the army and no one knows you and exactly your strength and you are not familiar with the bits and bytes of the regular life so what do you do there so I think first of all uh, I'll go to two steps back uh, one of the things that helped me with my decision to let to leave the military was that I went to a psychologist back then and I think that that would That was a major support uh, for for the, the the decision itself and and for the time after it um, and and then when I left, I think that the first thing that helped me was actually to acknowledge the fact that I have those blind spots, and I think that many pilots, for example, they don't acknowledge it. they just feel that um, they are super talented they've you know they've done a lot uh, at a very early stage early stage of their life. And they're just you know ready to conquer the next big thing and and I think that that that's not the case right so we have we do have a lot of gaps and blind spots, and the first thing is to to understand that and you actually speak here about this um arrogancy that sometimes we see a uh, very successful uh, uh I know it's a generalization and it's not true for everyone, but uh we do see sometimes very successful people that did a lot of things in a very early stage. With these uh, a bit of uh, agony and the things that they can concur everything and all the next steps and and actually like you say acknowledging the fact that we don't know everything and that we still have so much more uh, to learn and and yes we are very very talented so it will our learning curve will be maybe easier and we can uh, consume a lot of knowledge and and really be successful in a shorter uh, time frame but to come with this humbleness and not to think that we know it all it's something very very important also for founders uh, that are very young uh, to be listening to listen to what other people say to what investors say to what they get from the market and not to come from with this uh, mindset that they know it all then that they have the answers yeah I, I I fully agree and I think that is something that I really tried to uh, that's the mentality that I tried to uh, to be in. Um, the metaphor that I use uh, for people that I talk to in this position of living the a long uh, living the, the military after a long service is that we have a very strong right arm but a very weak left arm and that we must train that left arm if we want to become successful um, in our uh, you know civil um, uh, chapter in life I like it <laughs> I'm gonna take it with take me. It, take it with, you. <laughs> <laughs> with pleasure <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, th- I think I did have this um, this humbleness and I, I think that um, after I left I, uh, I decided I went traveling and I also realized I, I did a lot of you know um, coffee uh, meetings with people and try to and ask them uh, how they build their career and uh, I heard from many of them that that went and studied abroad that they, they, this was one of the, the best decisions they ever made. Um, and I decided I'll do that as well. And I was single back then. I had a, a lot of flexibility. I felt that I wanted to study after uh, being operational for many years. And I also felt that I wanted to get kind of an international perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, so break out of, of the small country of Israel. It's from the, the small country of the IDF, the, the Air Force, which is in the IDF, which is in Israel. So like you open your wings uh, literally and go beyond. Yes, yes, definitely. And, uh, and I, I also realized that I want to study sustainability. That was a, a, a very big, still is a very big passion of mine. Which is very aligned uh, with the values that we spoke about earlier as a child and later on uh, at Canot and things that are going through with you throughout your life. Yes, yes, for sure. I was also an instructor during my high school in Hugei Seoul. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, like a traveling uh, youth movement, uh, so a very big part of my life. And I wanted to study in a, in a top university. So I applied to Oxford. Luckily, I was uh, accepted. And I went there and it, it, it was really eye-opening. Um, I think it was also humbling and also difficult at some point. So uh, joining the university, 
And for the first time, going into a room and, and saying that I, I'm a pilot in the Israeli Air Force and understanding that this is perceived as a negative thing, mm -hmm. especially in Oxford, where you have the Israeli apartheid week and BDS, etc. So knowing that my, you know, my biggest strength is actually considered as a weakness, um, that was hard. And then, and also studying with students, so doing my master's with kids that are 22 years old, um, and, and um, sitting with them in class and, and, and realizing there's a huge gap between us, but that we're actually right now in the same, in the same position that was also... Uh, same age, same position, but mentally-wise, you're totally in different places. That is true, but then on, on the other hand, uh, in some places, they were better than me. So they had better English than I did. <laughs> they were better students than I was because they just finished their bachelor's degree um, and then continued to the master's and I haven't studied for the past uh, seven years. I, I couldn't read a book uh, in English um, when I graduated. But being in the Air Force, it's a very competitive uh, uh, culture and very successful people. So you were part of it. You were familiar with this uh, achievement, achievery and... and uh, competitiveness and all of a sudden you say that you feel that they are better than you yes uh, <laughs> and then, and then what I did is I decided <laughs> that I must be better than them so <laughs> this muscle came out with them. exactly <laughs> um, but 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 seriously you were talking about debriefing uh, earlier so I did I sat with myself every Friday um, for a personal debrief and wrote points in my notebook and About what I'm doing well and what should I improve um, and I took courses in English because I had to strengthen this um, left arm that was very weak um, it reminds me a bit like you said in the in the flight Academy that you you sat with yourself and you understood that you have to be like the boys what do I need to do in order to be one of them the same question so now it's a similar question what do I need to do in order to be better than them like this ability to see where you are and Where you want to be and what are the steps that you have to do in order to get there it's something that you, it, it seems like it's like very clear to you to use this method and to really break it down into things and later on into action items and later on really do it yeah I, I actually I, I, li I like the framing that you just did I never thought of it this way and I think that if we're talking about building on our strength then I think that this is one of my strength so every I think that every organization that I joined every group I was ever part of I was never the smartest person in the room um, but I managed to cope with it because I realized what it takes in order to succeed and you don't have to be the smartest person in the room in order to succeed in life I like it <laughs> and I think it's also a very it's a very strong message and because we don't need to be the smartest guy or girl in the room we need to be us. And then comparing to ourselves to our better selves we need to ask ourselves where do we want to get where do we want to go and then how do we get there not comparing uh, to others so Oxford England not London England, England. <laughs> for like two years for a year for a year for a year and then uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't like overwhelming and amazing experience and then you come back to Israel with a better English and a better British English not just <laughs> an English. <True. laughs> and, and and then what? So I came back, uh, actually applied to McKinsey London. I wasn't accepted. Um, and that is also, I think, an important message. So, so I think that my, my CV could be seen as something that, you know, was just filled with success stories, but that's not the case. There are a lot of failures um, in the way of doing successful things. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't accepted to McKinsey London. I realized I want to go back to Israel and, and, And then the, the next realization that I had is that, wow, I was a, you know, a pilot in the Air Force and I have this master's from Oxford. Um, so, you know, I can, I can do any job that I want. And then I got back to Israel and people ask me, but what can you do? And <laughs> then I realized, hmm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. What am I? What am I? I Who am I? And, and I don't have tools. Um, so I, I realized that... I need to um, to learn more tools and the first thing that I did is uh, join uh, Milken that's uh, in Jerusalem we did a fellowship in the government um, but when you speak about tools I mean 
I, I guess that you say it as a like general world word for skills for abilities for professional technical technological tools uh, uh, what is like the main thing that you feel that you felt that you're missing yeah so that's a great question I, I felt I was missing a lot of things but uh, I realized that I Um, what I want to do is to focus on sustainability and that I want to use economical or financial tools for that. So I could, you know, go and study law or engineering uh, or teaching, but I wanted to focus on the economical part, side of the things. The economic aspects. Yes. I think that economic, economic incentives are so strong um, to drive change. Um, and I was also wondering where can I make the, larger, the largest impact on, through the public sector or private sector or our nonprofit sector um, so I f- I would join Milken so, so I just want to add on this because as, as person as mature person and also uh, all the founders that they see uh, there's always this uh, feeling that we have so many things that we need to learn and to know better and I myself feel it all the time that I want to be a Uh, better and and with more knowledge in this aspect and this aspect and this aspect because everything that we touch in and you know work it's a combination of different disciplines and these different world worlds and we have this inner drive to know more to grow to give more uh, impact uh, uh, when we speak to others and when, when we consult them or when we invest and understanding and this is very important to my opinion that we won't be able to know everything and And we won't be able to know all the technological tools and all the marketing tools that are changes, you know, change every, every day. And, and the understanding that we simply won't know everything, but as long as we're in a, you know, a learning state of mind and that we're curious about everything that happens, that's great. Because sometimes if we're not in that state of mind, it can just bring a lot of stress into our life and the feeling that we're not good enough. And the feeling that someone else knows much better and yeah many other people knows uh, much better in their uh, aspects but we know a lot in what we do and and the idea is not to be better than others but to be better uh, uh, to ourselves all the time and to understand that we w- simply want to be able uh, to know everything but to want to improve and I think this is something very uh, important to embrace I also tell it to myself and When I try to say okay gather there are just 24 hours a day you cannot learn more than you're learning and, and uh, consuming all the time okay. yeah I agree and I, I would add on it uh, the power of focus so if we try right. to go to be good at everything we're eventually good at nothing and it's it's definitely okay that you know I know nothing about engineering um, or that I will not be that, that uh, my knowledge in, in law is not good enough to And, and that's also why um, as a team uh, uh, as founders team we need to bring together with us the co-founders that will complete us in the, uh, in their strength and also to work with external advisors or uh, service providers depends lawyers or accountants that will help us bridge the gap of the things that we don't know because definitely in the beginning and as we're in the fir- first timer as entrepreneurs there is so much knowledge that we just don't have the And, and yeah we need to try and uh, 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 learn as much as we can and absorb it but also to know to lean on people that will help us uh, yeah and it and goes back to, to to our point about being aware to our blind spots exactly. so as long as we're aware of them we can ask find the right people and ask them the right questions exactly it's it's all a matter of awareness mm-hmm. and consciousness yes um, so so I John Milken and that's the, the 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 fellowship in the government was around financial incentives and In exporting water technologies so I did that for one year learned a lot um, also realized that at this point I didn't want to work for the government but move uh, to to the private sector where the pace is much uh, faster uh, I don't think it's you know it's better or, or worse I think it's more of a just what's better for you yeah exactly it fits you and I wanted to run fast mm-hmm. at this uh, point and Um, and then I, I gave McKinsey a second shot this time it worked I joined the Tel Aviv office um, and it's also an important uh, lesson as we, as I said yeah because London said no but maybe in Israel specifically they knew to uh, appreciate your uh, relative advantages and the things that you do and it's also 
I think that nowadays it's a bit different post covid question mark post covid mm-hmm. but with the remote work and recruiting people from all around the world so it's the the, the market is much much more uh, globalized but back then uh, uh, Israeli recruiters maybe can appreciate more the competitive uh, advantages that you have and as in Israeli as an uh, uh, pilot etc et yeah I think they definitely the Israeli office better understood the context and so, what so I'm the message is me. not don't just don't skip your dreams I mean try again yeah. and it might work for sure and I think that also the year that I spent at Milken was also very helpful so so the office in London told me like we like you but you're missing some basic economical financial tools and then I did that year in Milken I strengthened my left arm and <laughs> then I uh, I reapplied and uh, and it worked um, and and McKinsey was good kind of my my the school that I wanted instead of of doing an MBA uh-huh. and I'm very happy for that that experience um, McKinsey is a, is a very sp- special work special place to work for how many years have you been there so 18 months there um, it's I, I learned uh, tons in different industries and different projects and different people that I worked with and um, It was also very difficult in terms of work life balance and and also in terms of the fact that um, I was working on different projects and not kind of trying to to drive forward something that I personally cared about mm-hmm. and then uh, while I was there the tragedy in uh, in Nahal Safit uh, with Mahinat um, Nation happened where 10 uh, students uh, died in a in a flood uh, about uh, three and a half years ago and uh, uh, I won't get too much into details here but I, I suddenly felt this urgency of of uh, leaving everything that I did and uh, trying to to rebuild the place um, to extract the lessons and to to build a better place um, it's like the sustainability that we spoke about and the giving back of And the volunteering and yourself as someone who uh, uh, was on her own in, in cannot like at the age of 18 like everything was combined together yes into this decision definitely I felt that um, the kind of the stars aligned um, and I can take all of the tools and all the things that I did in order to to rebuild this place in a, in a better way um, also to give back um, bring the Uh, methods from flight Academy from the Israeli Air Force from McKinsey from Oxford and tried to apply them and uh, and I was wrong uh, I went there uh, did work there for a bit less than a year until the Ministry of Education decided that we won't open the next year um, and and eventually again I can I can talk about it for hours but um, I think that it was definitely too early to And too painful to try and uh, rebuild the place um, and also the kind of the framework that I had in mind uh, um, that was like in the Air Force after a squadron there's a you know an accident in the squadron mm-hmm. and we start stop everything mm-hmm. and we debrief and we learn what happened and we extra- extract lessons and then we kind of reopen the squadron mm-hmm. and go back to flying that's what I had in mind and And uh, I didn't realize that in the in the world outside uh, in the Israeli society that it doesn't work it does exactly work. the same no and it takes more more time tremendously more time uh, to observe everything and and to be able yeah and uh, definitely and also the fact that we weren't on a mission so in the Air Force you're on a mission and you, you must go back to flying um, because you have a duty for again for for the citizens of Israel to protect them. And um, here in the in the Israeli society for a nonprofit organization that runs uh, an educational program um, it doesn't have to last it's like it didn't have it, it lacked the sense of urgency uh, of urgency and also the, the you know the basic question of why why is it a must to reopen this place I was um, I was asked this every day several times Uh, when I try to explain to people what we're doing there, everyone asked me that question. And while I had you know good answers for it for, for myself and for them, um, I also realized that the other way around also made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and with all the pain 
and the timing back then, uh, and the fact that uh, you know the the legal procedures haven't started yet, um, it was just too much. And you're talking here about another very big decision, like the decision that you had when you were in your mid-20s, either to stay in the army for like four more years or to leave it, getting out of your comfort zone, what we spoke earlier, and another a big decision, what do I do here? So what are the inner mechanisms that, you know, helped you uh, to choose for yourself, for a shearer, what is the right uh, path to go now? After Bnetzion? Yeah, I mean, to leave Bnetzion. Yeah, so I think after the Ministry of Education decided that we will not open the next year and, and realizing, acknowledging the fact that I was in a, in a, in a problematic point in my life. Uh, very, I was exhausted. Uh, I, was, uh, I was really, really down. I had like zero energies and also felt like I needed to... Um, Yeah. like to, to reconsider Recon- my path yeah. um, I felt like I'm not I'm not the right person to keep on managing this uh, organization mm-hmm. and that it's time for me to leave and I took some a few months off and uh, and at this point in life I decided that no matter what I do I uh, I listen to myself now so and this is a, a so powerful uh, you know message uh, that sometimes it's really hard for us to uh, uh, To, to work accordingly, but really this listening to ourselves and to really what happens there in our mind and, and, and stomach and, and uh, guts and everything together and to really listen to it and to allow it to, to allow it to guide us. What are the next steps? What do we need to do? Not everything we can explain in a rational way, but really learn how to listen to all the n- little nuances, what happens in the body and what happens in the mind and what are the signs? And to give it uh, like a respectful uh, uh, place in our decision making process, it's something very important. And you made two couple of brave uh, decisions. I, I mean, maybe you won't like the word brave because it's you. It's like t- uh, decisions that are true for you. But if we s- look at this you know, like socially wise or uh, so it's brave, you know, leaving the army and then leaving everything and going to Oxford. And then trying again to McKinsey, and then going to Bnetzion. And we have several more. We'll get there. <laughs> so like something of this resilience that we spoke about earlier uh, uh, that you took with yourself uh, from the army, it's something that we see uh, that goes through you uh, in your life, uh, this ability to listen to really how you feel and what's true for you. What is the right fit for you? Yeah, I, I, I agree and I think that uh, that's, that's another strength of mine, the, 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 uh, the capability to go out of my comfort zone and to make brave decisions. Um, I also, you know, pay prices sometimes for it, uh, but I, I, I prefer it that way. And, and actually when I, uh, when I left the Air Force and I was really trying to, to find the uh, You know my new path and and to shape my identity and it wasn't easy times for me at all uh, I had on uh, you know on, on my iPhone uh-huh. in my background uh, <laughs> picture I had this quote saying that uh, be yourself everyone else is already taken can yeah um, so that kind of le- led me and and it was there for a year or so so I really had to, to keep on reminding it to myself so you know it was there for a year but then in this specific moment like you It made sense to you you know and I really agree with this be yourself everyone else is already taken and also you mentioned something that yeah I made brave decisions but it comes with a price and everything in life comes with a price everything and the question is the inner negotiation with ourselves what kind of prices are we willing uh, to pay and then we go for it and what is uh, too high too heavy we don't want to do it and that's also okay but being aware to the uh, pros and cons to the uh, uh, good results and to the prices this is the name of the game to my opinion it's everything a question of prices all that everything has a cost and it's balancing it it's a dance of how we balance the cost the prices and in each and every step of the way it changes also you know the volume and the mix it changes it definitely so for now for example um, so, so after Bnation when I listen to myself and, and I gave a lot of place to to what my gut told me to do Um, I decided to join vintage and vintage was kind of 
the opposite to Bnation. So it, it's, it's a fund, it's in the private sector. It's very stable. It's, it's really like zero risk. Um, and, and that's what I felt I needed. I felt that, uh, so I was considering staying in the, um, in the social sector and joining maybe another Mechina or another NGO. And I considered going to the public sector. And, and, and my, my stomach kept on telling me, don't go there. You don't have the energies. Mm-hmm. You don't want to fight. You don't want politics. That's like you've had enough of this. And, and I just wanted to join a place where I feel at home, where I feel the intentions of people are good, that I know that will, will not close in one or two years like a, a young startup, um, where I don't have uh, employees. Uh, I just, you know, I just manage myself and there's n- never something urgent. So n- really nothing happens if the slides that I need to make will be ready tomorrow and not today. Um, and, and, th- and that's what I wanted. Um, so I became from, you know, being very brave and doing very risky things to being very risk averse. And I'm totally fine with that because uh, as you said, it's about, it's about timing and about what matters in life at this point in time. You really needed the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 to feel that you're grounded. That yes. Literally, mm-hmm. okay? Like, and metaphorically, <laughs> you needed to feel that you're uh, grounded, that you're uh, at home, that you're in your uh, uh, safe place, and, and then from them to take the risks in a different way. Because as an investor, of course, you take the risks all the time, and you manage the risks, and you try to, uh, uh, to minimize the risk for the, the fund and the investment uh, decisions that you make. But you needed to feel uh, uh, grounded and that it's like uh, this is your home now after all the amazing and, and not easy you know, to, to, to digest uh, things uh, that happen. And, but I think that you are brave. Again, you can, we can argue about the brave uh, uh, word you just being you because something else also happened in around this time that uh, uh, you joined the uh, vintage in your personal life yeah so um, I was you mentioned the lowest of lows at the at the opening of the show and uh, and and I was after Bnation I was really at the lowest of lows um, not after but actually just before the decision that we will not open I was at the lowest of lows um, things at Bnation were not uh, going well. And, um, and I was single and I was 32. Um, and I, uh, you know, I went to sleep every day alone. I was trying to, uh, to find a relationship for, uh, you know, I was single for a bit more than two years and, and not even one, like one person that I dated, it didn't, it didn't work for more than two or three meetings. And, and I knew that I wanted a relationship, but, but nothing happened. So I was frustrated about that as well. And also a lot of pressure, you know, from, so you, you want to be yourself and you want to detach yourself from what the society thinks, but eventually that has an impact as well. And all the friends that surrounded me were starting to have children. Um, and then the next thing that happened um, is that I met with Shani. Um, and, uh, and I realized that uh, actually I was, I was dating only men until then. Um, and that I, I felt that something there with Shani, with the dynamics that we had, with her personality, um, w- was something that I wanted to, to make room for. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe that was the bra- bravest thing that I did in my life, um, to, uh, to come to my parents and to my friends at the age of uh, 32 and telling them, I know I've been dating men until now. Um, and I know that, you know, I've loved and I've had meaningful relationship with men, but actually I'm, I'm dating a woman now. And I, I already knew it and, and I listen to you now and it's so uh, beautiful and so touching uh, beyond the story itself, the way that you uh, describe it, so sincere and beautiful. Again, brave or not brave, this is who you are. You just listen to your guts. And even more, um, you're very curious and open to what life brings. You know, we, we cannot plan yeah. everything that happens. And, uh, you know, I see your eyes when you speak <laughs> and you're just so open to what life brings and it happened. And I, I saw Shani in the pics and she looks amazing. And, but really, it's uh, such a great uh, uh, person. 
And, and, and it's amazing to see how you allow yourself to navigate yourself within life and not necessarily being uh, um, uh, affected but by, uh, you know, other considerations or what maybe other people think. And as you said, your father was a pilot and your mother is a psychoanalyst. And, and, and you know, there are many uh, serious and, uh, you know, smart people around you. And what will they say? And yet to really be to do. To really be uh, you know uh, straightforward with yourself with your inner Ashira and how she feels and what she wants and what's right for her and actually it's really amazing and like very uh, touching things that is about to happen soon yeah and before I get to that okay, thing okay. I will <laughs> just like to be to be sincere just uh, uh, a bit more and say that uh, it does sound you know uh, perfect I was listening to myself and I met Shani and uh, and everything was just frictionless but I Uh, it's also important to say that um, I knew that I was interested in women since I was in high school, uh, but I was afraid of doing anything about it uh, because I was very concerned and uh, um, and kind of tasked with being uh, very successful. And, um, and I, I just stayed away from, from it and I didn't I didn't uh, le- I, I, I didn't let those feelings really uh, I didn't make room for them uh, and I And I only did it when I was kind of uh, at the lowest of lows, and I felt that, okay, there is something in my life that really calls me, and maybe it's it's the time that I listen to it. And, and it's important for me to say it because I think that you know many times in life, um, we, we do have those voices or feelings that we just push aside. Um, and, 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 it's, and that is also okay. Um, so, so just uh, to if, if I'm being 100 honest, just to to emphasize the part that it's not that I'm just you know always listening to myself and uh, always very accurate. You know, it, it took me it took me like 15 years. And thanks for sharing it and I think it's very very uh, meaningful and yeah no, no one thought it, it was easy. like we said earlier, everything comes with a price and with the cost and you felt that for like 15 years you had to hide. Uh, something but I think that you bring here such a strong uh, uh, message maybe to the girl who's now in her fifth or th- uh, sixth uh, grade that uh, on the one hand she can choose to be with whoever she wants to and to feel how she wants to and side by side she can be a pilot and she can be at McKinsey and she can uh, uh, be an investor and she can do anything and anything and everything and I think that this is such a strong message that that uh, In the past, people really, you know, uh, looked at this in, in the wrong way. And, and you bring yourself out there in such a touching and sincere way. And I think that you give such an, uh, a strong uh, and important message to men and women. It's also true for uh, men just uh, uh, to be very honest with who we are and, and maybe not to wait um, 15 years. <laughs> 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 If this is something that you can help them, you know, uh, A, a short uh, or a cutting show with this period and no one said it's easy I'm sure that you dealt with a lot of things uh, uh, during this time and it wasn't easy and a lot of things to digest and how will I talk about it and how will I present it and for sure nothing is like uh, very simple and easy but seeing you here now uh, with a smile and such an intelligent and amazing uh, woman and investor it's really uh, it's so uh, inspiring and Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what, what happened? Yeah, so next uh, we're expecting, so Shani's pregnant. We're expecting our first daughter uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and then life will change going, again. Going to, be, going to be mothers, co-mothers, yes. co-mothers, yeah. like co-founders, right? <laughs> Co- <laughs> co-mothers. <laughs> yeah. What a lucky child. He or she will, it's, it's a she. It's a she. It's a she. Yeah, it's a she. What a lucky girl she will be to, to have a... Uh, co-mothers it's really it sounds amazing <laughs> thanks yeah hopefully <laughs> so tell me nowadays it's vintage like when you look at um, uh, uh, invest at, uh, uh, you're choosing an investment or you look at the founders team how do you feel that you bring all this uh, life experience and the things that you uh, gone through at the air at the, the Air Force in, in England in McKinsey uh, At the Bnetzion, your own personal uh, evolvement and changes that you made when you look at founders team when you're choosing an investment how do you think it like uh, correlates into it 
Um, so that's a great question. I think, first of all, to, to say a few words about vintage, um, because it's not a straightforward fund. Um, so we invest in both funds and companies. Uh, we manage three, three billion dollars, and, and most of this money is invested in funds. So we try to um, identify the best funds in the world and, and invest in them. And then we also invest from a different vehicle um, in, in companies, in late stage companies together with our funds. Um, and, and, and that's a very diff that, that's a very different and very interesting approach and, uh, and you know, uh, a wonderful school for myself. Uh, I've been there for two years now and uh, I feel that, uh, you know, my, the learning curve is just endless. I'm just at the beginning of uh, this journey. Um, and I think that what I bring with me to the table mostly is uh, um, this modesty um, of first uh, acknowledging the fact that I have a lot of blind spots. And second, from being a social entrepreneur that failed, um, coming very um, um, from, from the same level as the founders themselves. So I think that I never um, sincerely feel better, stronger, more knowledgeable than any founder or any investor that I meet with. Um, and I, I really try to listen. And that sounds very humble and, and so true to come from this uh, uh, point of view and state of mind that they are learning from me and I'm learning from them. And it's this cycle that we uh, nourish each other all the time. And that makes me a better uh, investor. And then I can be better with my founders and also be better with my uh, 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 investment um, fund. Uh, because I learn all the time and I don't come from, if we spoke earlier about what sometimes happens to pilots uh, with the arrogancy, so exactly not coming from this point of view and understanding that I'm learning all the time and I'm proving and I'm debriefing and I bring this method into the founders that I'm speaking with and into the uh, VC uh, itself. In your day-to-day, -day, you only, uh, are you just with the companies or just with the uh, funds or both. both? So everyone at our team is doing everything. So we're investing in funds, investing in companies, and we also do secondary investments. And uh, yeah, we, we, we think that it makes us better as, as individuals and as a team that everyone does everything. And are there specific verticals that uh, you like to focus more on? Yeah, so um, each one, also focuses on specific um, verticals. Um, we think that today we must develop, uh, we must come with prepared minds to, to meeting with companies, uh, especially today the market is so competitive that if you're meeting with a company and in, you're just starting to learn this vertical, um, then you're likely to be too late and the other funds will kind of win the deal. Um, and I'm leading everything related to sustainability, to climate tech. Surprising. Surprising. <laughs> um, and everything related to healthcare. And that is something new to me and, uh, and something that I'm, uh, I'm paying a lot of attention to learning. And it sounds like that during your journey, you really find the place that you bring your own uh, strength and the values that uh, are going th with you through your whole life exactly to this uh, place of investing in startups in areas and verticals that really uh, that really suits you so maybe before we uh, hit the pause uh, button like talking to uh, founders what is uh, the best advice not as an investor as Shira uh, that you can uh, give them from your journey I think <laughs> that's a hard <laughs> question. Can I break it to three? Of course. Great. Maybe even to four. <laughs> um, okay. I, I think number one is uh, believing in yourself, right? So, so having this very vivid picture in your mind that, that you can succeed. Um, the second thing is debriefing. So getting better all the time. The third thing is resilience. And I think that the fourth thing is listening. 
I think these are really uh, great. Uh, it's not even tips. It's like a, it's a way of life. I think that once we, in order to achieve and to, suc- to succeed in everything we want to do, as parents, as investors, as founders, as uh, managers, leaders, as long as we believe in ourselves and we debrief our actions and, and we keep the mental resilience in place and we learn how to listen, so uh, we improve and we grow all the time. And this is the way I see uh, success uh, that can happen uh, if we keep on those, uh, those elements. Shira, wow, it was really amazing to talk to you today about your journey and, and the Israeli Air Force and you, the choices that uh, you made and uh, uh, the openness that you brought into our conversation. And I really appreciate it. And I had a lot of uh, fun. So thank you for that. Thank you all very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. That's great. And uh, if peop- uh, founders uh, that would like um, uh, to address uh, vintage or you, uh, what is the right way uh, to go? So I think uh, LinkedIn or even my, my email, shirae at vintageip.com. Great. Thank you. To our lovely listeners, we're going to hit pause until the next episode. That's also something I'd say to the entrepreneurs in my clinic in between sessions. Thanks to the amazing studios at Google Campus that really uh, helps the startups uh, to kick off everything uh, that they need. So thank you for, uh, for that. Uh, feel free to visit my website at galiblochliran.com and leave your details there if you wish to be updated and learn from and learn more about the mental aspects of the entrepreneurial journey. Also, be sure to follow my podcast, The Startup Nation Clinic, in any of your podcast apps. Let's hit pause. Till next time. It's really great to have you here. Thanks, Shira. Thank you. <laughs> the Human Founder Podcast by Galiblochliran.com